such a clever way. And within a few minutes, I, the little goods that I had accrued were in a plastic bag, and off I was in a truck heading for Kabul. Seven hours later, after a dusty, bumpy ride, we came into Kabul and drove straight past the airport. But I was okay, I just thought, well, there are other Westerners being held by the Taliban. We're probably going to pick them up. All I know is that I'm going home on a Red Crescent plane. That night, I was to find out another aspect to the character of the Afghan people. They don't like giving you bad news. They don't like telling you anything that will upset you or cause an adverse reaction. And so we drove past the airport and then we pulled into a really grim prison. Everything that you would imagine a third world prison to be. And I was asked to get out and I got out and we walked down this dark, dingy corridor and then they pushed open this little metal door with a little spy hole in it. And there, sitting on a concrete floor, were two Afghan women, one with a baby in arms and the other one heavily pregnant. And they said, tonight you will stay here. And I said, no, 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 you've made a mistake. I am going home on a red crescent plane. Of course, the thing is, when you lead someone on, you have to deliver the bad news at some point. And so the bad news was delivered to me then. You're going nowhere, you were a bad woman, you entered our country illegally, without a passport, you have to be punished. I screamed and shouted, there was no way I was going to go into this cell and to get me out and get me to the airport. And I said to them, you can't do this to me, I'm British. And they smiled. Just then, Another cell door opened, and six women wearing hijabs came out. And one of them said to me, are you from the Red Cross? I said, you speak English? And she said, well, I'm Australian. These three are Germans, and the other two are Americans. And I went, oh my God, you're the Christians, the charity workers who were locked up for trying to convert Muslims to Christianity. And they said, yes. And I said, look, there's been a terrible mistake. I'm supposed to be going home on a red crescent plane. Will you tell these people? And the women all spoke the language. And I could tell by the heated conversation and the expressions on everyone's face that I was going nowhere that night, certainly not on a red crescent plane. Deanna Thomas, the Australian girl, said to me, look, why don't you stay in our cell tonight and then we can sort this mess out later. And in truth, I hadn't had any female company for over six days. These girls spoke my language. Furthermore, if I ever got out of this hellhole, I might have an even better story to tell. So I said, yes, okay and I followed them into their cell and I looked around and it was so grim. It's everything you would think a third world prison to be. And suddenly I broke down and I started to cry. The first tears that I had cried since my captivity. And I said, well, the Taliban have finally broken me. And amid the sobbing I felt for my cigarettes, because although cigarettes were banned under the Taliban, when they realized I smoked, they gave me lots of cigarettes. So I pulled out my cigarettes, and I was about to light up when I just said, oh, does anybody mind if I smoke? And the tears were coming down, and I'm sobbing and about to light my cigarette, when they all said, yes, this is a no-smoking cell. How 
could I find the only no-smoking cell in Asia? How unlucky can you get? They said, look, if you must smoke, go outside into the courtyard. We're about to have a meeting. Suddenly, my nicotine craving went, and I said, a meeting? And they said, yes, we have two meetings a day. And I'm looking round and I'm thinking, what happens round here that they have two meetings a day? <gasps> it's the escape committee. <laughs> They're digging a tunnel, and this is a progress report. <laughs> so I said, do you mind if I listen in to your meeting? And they said, no, not at all. So I suddenly forgot about my cigarettes for the time being, and I sat on the edge of this bunk bed, and the six girls sat in a circle on the floor, and then they pulled out their Bibles. And I'm thinking, I don't believe this. They have been charged under Sharia law with trying to convert Muslims to Christianity. They're in serious trouble. They could be executed. And now they're getting their Bibles out. And I'm looking at the door expecting the Taliban to come bursting in and beat them up or do something horrible to them. And nothing happened. Of course, as I did read the Quran later, it states quite specifically that we must, as Muslims, protect people of the book, i.e. Jews and Christians, and we must allow them to carry on and carry out and perform their faith. And this is exactly what the Taliban were allowing the Christians to do, although I didn't realize it at the time. So they read from the Bible, a very, a very loudly, a passage appropriate to their position. And after 20 minutes, they put their Bibles down and pulled out handwritten pieces of paper. And then they started to sing. Now, I can tell you, as you know, I was a a practicing Christian in those days. And when I say practicing, I probably went to church maybe twice a month, which in some people's eyes is bordering on fanaticism. And we would sing, you know, these Victorian hymns, and, uh, and they started singing, not Victorian hymns. We are talking very loud, very robust, happy clappy, full-on, Southern Baptist style, hallelujah type singing. So this started, and at that point, I went outside into the courtyard, and I smoked three cigarettes off the trot. The azan, the call to prayer, started, and I thought, I don't believe it. I've got Muslims on that side of the wall, Christian fundamentalists in that cell. No wonder that religious cleric was smiling as he left me. He probably thought, she won't convert? Well, feed her to the Christians. <laughs> Although I make fun of them, I have to say that, their, that those six girls were incredibly strong and their faith did get them through their ordeal, which lasted much, much longer than mine. After they'd finished singing, they then started praying. And again, it was really full on, in your face, hallelujah type praying. In fact, at one point, they were all shouting different things. And at one point, I could hear one of the girls, I think it was the American girl, Heather, shouting, Lord Jesus, show me the way out of here. And I have a very gallows sense of humor, and I felt like shouting back straight down the corridor and turn left, but there's a great big talib there. <laughs> that night, I slept on this concrete floor with a very wafer-thin mattress. And when I woke up the next morning, I was given a change of clothes. In fact, I'm wearing the prison clothes now. Now, 
Nobody put me in an orange jumpsuit, shaved, shackled, or abused me, or raped me, or sodomized me, or videoed me for the gratification or pleasure of others later on. As you can see um, from what I'm saying, my experience was completely different to those who fell into the hands of the Americans. So that morning, a new change of clothes, so I set about washing the old ones. And one of the German girls took me into the courtyard and gave me a metal bucket and took me to a hand pump and she said, you can get your water from there. And I'm looking at this contraption which looked as though it had come from one of those old Western movies and I started cranking it. And eventually some water came out and I'm saying, this is amazing. How do they heat it underground? And she started laughing. She said, it's cold. I was given a pumice stone and uh, some soap flakes and, and I set about washing uh, my clothes. And I then hung them on the washing line in the prison courtyard. Within five minutes, I'm sitting trying to enjoy the last days of the summer sun, and the prison governor came in, a great big man with a huge beard and really a very scary looking dude. And he came in, and in broken English, he said to me, he growled at me, remove those garments. And I'm looking, I said, it's my washing. Remove them now. And I said, I can't. It's my washing. I am washing my clothes. This is a washing line. We dry our clothes on the washing line. Well, cover them up. And I'm looking, I said, you stupid man. You've obviously never done the washing in your life. How on earth will it dry if it's covered up? So he stood there for a couple of moments and then he said, well, take those items down. And he looked the other way and sort of pointed. And I realized he was talking about my underwear. <laughs> and I said, no, this is the female wing of the prison. If you don't like what you see, clear off. He said, remove them. And I said, no, if you don't like them, you remove them. And I thought he was going to explode on the spot. He then went storming off. And he returned 15 minutes later with the deputy foreign minister of Afghanistan. <laughs> These people are about to be bombed by the most powerful country on earth. And a diplomatic incident was unfolding as a result of my underwear. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass the men here, but I mean, we're not talking anything small, salacious and lacy. We're talking big, comfortable Bridget Jones. <laughs> so the Deputy Foreign Minister said to me, will you please remove your undergarments from the line? And I said, look, this is the female wing of the prison. There are no male prisoners. The only men around at the moment are you two. If you clear off, there will be no men. By the time they're dried, nobody's going to be any the wiser. He said, yes, but the Taliban soldiers live above the female wing of the prison. And if they look out and see those things, they'll have impure thoughts. I'm looking at my underwear in a new light now. <laughs> I said, there's a very easy solution to this. He said, I knew there would be. I said, tell your men not to look out of the window. <laughs> no, no, that's impossible. I thought, I cannot believe this. You know, America didn't need to fly over in B-52s and bomb these people. They should have just parachuted in a regiment of women soldiers waving their underwear. 
and the Taliban would have gone. <laughs>